So before we get into the word this morning, I want to start with a question that I want you to think about. And the question is this, how many of you this morning like to be stretched? That's the response I got for a service. You just chuckle at me. Yes, <laughs> to be stretched, right? Uh, just the picture of it doesn't sound very, very comfortable, but remember this, being a follower of Jesus Christ, by definition almost, means that your life, you're going to be stretched. The Lord, the Lord is going to stretch you. And I don't think Jesus ever actually used the word stretch, but he did say this. He, he did say that, uh, that in order to contain new wine, there needs to be a new wineskin, right? And, and, and that implies that, that as the kingdom of God is doing its work in our hearts and lives, it's going to stretch us. And we need, to have, we need to have a life that's moldable and pliable. We need to let God do what he wants to do in our lives, and that's going to stretch us. And remember this, though, whenever God stretches you, he's stretching you for your good, right? Uh, because he's going to take you places that you will never go in your life without first being stretched. Being a Christian means that, that you're going to live by faith, that you're not going to have everything figured out, uh, and, 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 and you're going to have to take steps of faith in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 6, says this, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we, were at home, we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by what? We walk by faith, not by sight. And church, it's a good thing that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because if you walk by sight, if you look around our world right now, what are you going to see? Hatred, strife, fear, anger. So it's a good thing, church, that we walk by faith and not by what we see. Amen? We walk by faith, and through faith, we can love. Through faith, we can trust, we can believe, we can build. Through faith, we can overcome, right? So in your notes this morning, as we continue our series on what it means to be a kingdom person, uh, write this down, kingdom people are people who walk, who live a life, rather, of faith. Kingdom people are people who live a life of faith. God wants to move us from fear into faith, right? God wants to move us from fear into love. God wants to move us from fear into a life of generosity. So this morning we're going to talk about living a life of faith by being a generous person. By being a generous person. Generosity is highly valued in the kingdom of God. In fact, generosity, church, is one of our core values here at Bethel Church, that we will be generous people. So I'm going to give you nine things. My message has nine points today. Can you believe it? Nine, nine reasons why we should value generosity, all right? And the first one is this. Generosity is a tangible way to give honor to the Lord, it's a tangible way to give honor to the Lord. Now, there, there are many ways that our lives should honor the Lord. Our conduct should honor the Lord. Amen? Our relationships should honor the Lord. Our words, what's coming out of our mouths, should honor the Lord. Our Facebook posts, come on. <laughs> should honor the Lord. All right? There are many, many things in our life that all should honor the Lord, but one of the ways that we show honor to the Lord is with our financial generosity. 
Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. So church, giving is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. Through giving, we bring honor to the Lord. And notice it says there, with the first fruits of your produce. So in the Old Testament times, they, they tithed, with the, which is the giving of 10%. They tithed off the produce of the land and off the livestock of their pastures because it was an agricultural economy. So that's how they gave their tithe to the Lord. And notice it says they, they tithe their first fruits. They gave of their first fruits. In, in other words, the first 10% of their crop went to the Lord, was given to the Lord. The first 10% of their livestock was given to the Lord. And they were to give the very best too. They were to give the livestock that was sick, crippled. They were to give the very best of the livestock. They were to the, give the best of the produce of the land. Because God is worthy of our first and our best. How many of you know God is not honored with leftovers? Right? And this is how some people give to the Lord. Some people make sure all of their other expenses are paid first, and they've bought everything they want, and then if there happens to be anything left over, well, then maybe I'll drop that in the offering. Friends, that kind of giving does not honor the Lord. It doesn't. What honors the Lord is when we give our first and we give our best. And by the way, it doesn't take any, any degree of faith to give God what's left over. It takes faith to give God the very first. Now, I used to say it this way. I used to say the first check you should write should be your tithe check to the Lord. I don't say that anymore because people don't write checks anymore. However you give, we are to give God our first and our best. And it's our way, our tangible way of bringing honor to Jesus Christ. You know, people that don't know the Lord, they don't get this. They don't understand it. In fact, it kind of blows them away. Why would you give that much to God? And so this is a way that that we give honor to the Lord, and it's actually part of our testimony, and it says to the world, this is how much God means to me. Now, how many of you know you could give all of your paycheck, right, and still not, you know, cover how much God means to us, for sure? But this is what God asked. In fact, the tithe, church, according to the word of God, that's the beginning point of our giving. That first 10%, that's the beginning point, and then as God lays on our heart to be even more generous, we give up and above the tithe. So generosity is a tangible way to give honor to the Lord. Secondly, generosity allows us to transfer our trust from ourselves to the Lord. Because our finances, they represent our hard work, our ingenuity, uh, our years maybe of of building up a business, and, uh, and, and we start over time really kind of trusting, trusting in our own ability. And, and we start to trust in our bank account instead of Jesus. And uh, it, can be, uh, it can feel like a relief to do that. On the other hand, it's really kind of a burden, uh, especially in comparison to putting our trust in Jesus to be our provider. So when we give, when we're generous, we're acknowledging that the Lord is our provider, that he's the one that's going to make a way for us. Uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 says, uh, and that should say 20, 11, I don't think it's through verse 25, 28 to 30. Uh, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Everybody say rest. Yeah, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah, this is the life the Lord wants us to have. Number three, generosity is another step in making Jesus the Lord of our lives. This is really 
the bottom line in our lives. Is Jesus, is Jesus really Lord? I mean, we know he's Lord because he's risen from the dead and he's the son of God and he reigns and rules, but is he the Lord of your life? And what you're going to find in your life is the Christian life is a process of surrender and submitting and making Jesus Lord of your life. How many of you have found that you, you thought you'd given the Lord everything and then later on something happened, something came up and you discovered that you really hadn't surrendered everything to the Lord yet? Right? Anybody beside me? Right? And, and because there's this, there's this process of, of becoming more and more like the Lord in our, our lives. And we, it's a life of surrender. And one of those areas that needs to be surrendered to the Lord is our finances. Is Jesus really Lord of our finances? So we make him, you know, our Savior. We make him the Lord of our family, the Lord of our marriage. We make him the, the Lord of our, our planning and our futures. We make Jesus the Lord uh, of all these different areas of our life. But a significant part of Jesus being Lord of our lives is, is he really Lord over our finances? Okay. Now, you might, you might think, well, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Well, just look at how some Christians act when their pastor starts talking about giving. And you realize that uh, this is not a money issue anymore. This is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Is Jesus really the Lord? Luke chapter 18 in the Gospels tells a story about a man, and the Bible says that this man was wealthy. He was powerful. He was a ruler, and he was young. He was young, had lots of money, was already a powerful guy, and he comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to the man, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. And this man responds, I've done all that since I was a boy. But then Jesus looks into this guy's eyes, and he sees dollar signs. You know, like in the cartoons, he sees dollar signs. So even though this guy has done all these other things, Jesus knows there's, there's something in this guy's heart that needs to be dealt with. And Jesus says to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, how many of you just say this morning, wow, that's heavy, right? That, <laughs> woo. Yeah, because Jesus didn't require this of everybody, but Jesus knew this guy would never be a follower until he gave up the one thing that was really the most important thing in his life. That he needed that was really he gave up the one he finances. He needed to lay down his wealth in order to make Jesus the Lord of his life. And then the Bible says, sadly, it says he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is so rich to enter the kingdom of God. So this is a lordship issue. Our money is a lordship issue, and it's an opportunity as we're generous to say, Lord, I give you everything. Every area of my life, including my finances, I lay it down before you. And then number four, generosity gives us the privilege of partnering with God in his mission. Partnering with God in his mission. There are too many Christians that take the approach of trying to get Jesus to partner with them in their mission. All right? Like, here's my mission, Lord. You're welcome to come along. Help me be successful, God. Right? Uh, that's not the call of being a follower of Jesus Christ. God has a mission, and it's the greatest mission in all the world, and it's the salvation. It's the salvation of those who are lost. Amen? And by 
By being generous with our finances, God invites us to partner with him in his mission in this world. Romans chapter 10 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We talked about that last week. And how, can they, uh, and, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent, all right? And so by giving of our finances, we send out missionaries, right? We, we help uh, with the finances of the church. We, we, uh, we're able to have pastoral staff, and we get to partner with what God is doing. Church, I believe 2021 is going to be a, a great year of opportunity for the church. I do. And, and I'm not saying that just because 2020 is over. You know, for, for all the hard things that happened in 2020, can I say this? A lot of good things happened in the spirit that many of us are unaware of. Because one of the things that happened in 2020 is God was doing a lot of pruning. Doing a lot of pruning. Now, the reason God does pruning is for our good. Because after the pruning comes more fruit right? And when God does pruning in your life, individually, personally, he's doing it for your good because your life is going to become even more fruitful for the Lord. And when God prunes the church, he does it for the good of the church because he intends to bring a great harvest for the church. Amen? Yeah. And I believe 2021, because of what, see, because here's what I saw in 2020, with all the stuff that was going on, I also saw Christians get on their knees like I've never seen them before. I've seen people show up for prayer meetings that never came to prayer before. I've seen us seeking the Lord with a new fervor and a new passion. And so I believe that what God has done for us in 2020, in spite of everything, God has done some great things. And 2021 is going to be a great year of opportunity for the church. Amen? And we... Get to partner with God, all right? So let me share a few practical opportunities that we're looking at. First of all, in 2021, we're seeking the Lord about this, but our goal right now is to plant a new church campus, a Bethel Church campus in Roseburg in 2021. You say, why on earth would we plant another church in Roseburg? Uh, There's some good churches there, but I'll tell you this, most people don't go to any of those churches. Most people in Roseburg don't go to church at all. They don't. The reason we're planning a new church in Roseburg is because there are people in Roseburg who need Jesus, right? People who need Jesus. And so this is going to take some financial investment. It's going to cost some money. It's going to cost some energy. But we believe it's well worth it. Uh, Another opportunity for us is to expand our own reach and our community. There's people who need Jesus in Roseburg, but there's a lot of people who need Jesus right here in Medford, amen? And so we wanna wanna expand our our ministry, our opportunity. I just met last night with some pastors along with a representative from Convoy of Hope. In the fall, we're planning on doing, uh, we're putting together a great outreach that's gonna involve distributing food to people uh, that are in need and sharing the gospel with people. It's gonna be a great opportunity for us in the fall through Convoy of Hope. Uh, One of the things that we put on the back burner during COVID is uh, we have, we've been making plans to do a complete overall of our children's ministry area, our facility downstairs. We just want to make it way more cool and kid-friendly. And uh, so that's another opportunity that's before us for this year. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to a great Easter this year. We're going to you know, do all kinds of things to make Easter uh, just a great day of people coming to church and getting saved. We have evangelist Sean Smith that's coming the the Sunday after Easter. We're excited about that. It is going to be a great, a great season of harvest. All of these things, church, they take financial resources, and we're believing God is going to supply our needs. Yeah. 
Uh, another opportunity is Feed One. This is our, our compassion ministry uh, through Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope uh, serves over 300,000 children every day across our world, making sure that they have nutritious food and good, clean drinking water. And uh, through uh, Feed One, through sponsoring a child for $10 a month, uh, uh, $10 a month, you can... You can take care of a child. You can feed a child and make sure they have drinking water through Convoy of Hope. And, and we're just looking to continue to expand how many kids are being served. And then another opportunity before us this year is to pay off our church mortgage. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Our, uh, our loan is due uh, in June of this year. Let me give you a little bit of history. Our original loan on this property was $1.6 million dollars. That's a lot of money, but our entire project up here was $6.5 million, so $1.6 million was really not a bad sum to, to borrow. So we've been paying that down, of course, over, since we've moved into the building. We've also had a number of people that have been uh, uh, committed to uh, help us pay down the principal, and they've been giving above their tithe toward the principal. And so we have actually got, as of December 31st, uh, of that uh, uh, 1.6 million, it's down to 306,000. Getting close. Now, I mentioned to you last week that last year, 2020, we had our highest giving year ever as a church. How does that happen in a pandemic? I don't know. Ask God. But it happened. Our highest year in our church's history was given last year, all right? So at our last board meeting in January, our church board took $80,000 from what was given last year over and above uh, our expenses. We took $80,000 and we paid it directly to our, to our principal, all right, so that brings us down to $226,000 owing. Between now and June, we'll have that down to about $200,000 just from our payments and what's already coming in for principal. So here's the challenge. I'm believing God that between now and June, above our tithes and offering, $200,000 is going to come in and we're going to completely pay off our mortgage as a church. Now, why am I excited about that? Well, I'm excited about that for a lot of reasons. First of all, I don't like being in debt. Neither do you. But also, it's going to save our, our monthly expenses uh, $3,200 every month that can be sewn back into, instead of paying the bank, it can be sewn back into ministry, right? And so for me, it just makes sense. I'm excited about it. And we just want to invite you uh, as the Lord leads you, we know some of you, you could write a huge check today. Uh, so there, there, am I, there I go talking about checks again. Some of you could give a, you know, a, a huge amount today and it would be you know, a, a sacrificial gift for you. We all have different abilities and God doesn't judge us by amounts, right? But by our heart, right? And so I just want to just encourage you over and above your tithes and offering, you can at any time just you know, on, in your offering, say this offering is given, uh, earmark your offering for uh, our mortgage payoff, and that's where it will go. And let's believe God together by June. Let's pay off our debt. Amen? Let's pay the mortgage. Everybody say together, let's pay the mortgage. Come on, more, more enthusiasm. <laughs> Number five. Generosity helps us slay the dragons of greed and materialism. The idols of this world, greed, consumerism, materialism, they want to creep into our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, anyone who is stealing must steal no longer. Now you wouldn't think you'd have to write that to Christians at church, but evidently Paul Paul felt he had to. Those who've been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share 
with those in need, all right? So it's going from being a taker to being a giver, all right? Paul says, stop stealing, get a job, do something with your own hands. So first of all, you can provide for your own life and don't need to steal anything and don't need to depend on anybody else. Church, there's just too many people in our world that feel like it's the government's job to take care of them. Am I stepping on some toes yet? Okay? No. Not only should we work with our own hands to provide for our own needs, but also to be able to give to those who are in need. So we go from being takers to being givers as Christians. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. The love of money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So by being a generous person, it helps us slay the dragon of greed, consumerism, materialism that's so pervasive in our culture. Number six. Generosity demonstrates true compassion. True compassion. It's one thing to say we love, and it's another thing to actually live a life of love. James chapter 2 and verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. All right? And I know no one here wants to have a dead faith. We want to have a living faith and show true, tangible compassion. Number seven, generosity helps us reorder our priorities. Reorder our priorities. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So it's a reordering of our priorities. Number eight, Generosity opens up the window of blessing. Come on, that should get an amen. amen. It opens up the window of blessing. And I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. You can never outgive God. You can't. Generosity is a way to demonstrate that we believe that God is going to be our provider. Remember this, Paul wrote, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, okay? That means little, not very much, all right? Stingy. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Listen, church, one of the reasons we want to be generous is because we have a Father who's been generous with us. God so loved the world that he gave. How many of you know that's as generous as it gets, right? That's as generous as it gets. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God wants to pour into our lives in abundance and when we're tight-fisted, right? When we're stingy and, 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 and not generous with our lives, right? It looks like this, but when we're, we're generous, we open our hands up, which is a lot better place to be and we open our hands up now we're ready to receive from God, right? Now God can pour into our lives. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, 
that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Now, how many of you know that is one beautiful graphic picture right there? See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Wow. And then number nine, generosity allows us to live a life of purpose and legacy. Now, you're going to get to heaven one of two ways. Either you're still going to be alive when Jesus comes back, or you're going to go the other way. Other way. You're going to, your body is going to eventually, you know, give up, give out, and uh, you're going to go into the presence of the Lord. And I know, I know for all of us, when that day happens, we're going to want to know we're going to want to know that our life here on earth had some purpose, had some meaning. And the time to be thinking about that is not when you're on your deathbed. The time to be thinking about that is right now, right? Because the goal is not on your deathbed to lay there and say, wow, I got a lot of money in the bank. How awesome has my life been? Right? Now, you're going to want to know that you, you gave something, you contributed, that you were part of some great things for the kingdom of God. You're going to want to leave a legacy. You're going to want to know that you lived with purpose. And, and there's a lot of ways to do that, but certainly our financial generosity is a part of that. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what a joy it is to be a part of what God is doing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a question to think about right here at the end, and then we're going to pray together. And the question is this, what if... What if instead of seeing the sharing of our financial resources as a burdensome obligation, we saw it as an amazing privilege? And it's just a totally different mindset about money. It's a transformative mindset about our finances and being a generous person. You know, our world doesn't really value generosity but God does. Amen? God does. Should be the earmark, hallmark of the Christian life, being a generous person, having a generous heart.